just had the outsider accepted by Golenx, and Angus lent me his cottage to write ritual in. And uh, he had a shelf full of powers. I tried reading it when I was there for about a month in this place in the middle of nowhere, near Bury St. Edmunds. And uh, I must say I found it very difficult indeed. He had later things. Uh, he had the brazen head and Atlantis. Now, I must say I found them completely unreadable. I discovered Paris in my early teens. I discovered the pleasures of literature. And uh, I hated it. I felt that uh, it was a sort of literary Aunt Tabitha. You could almost hear the knitting needles clicking while I was writing. I felt his mind lacked a sort of slicing, cutting edge. And I still feel this to a large extent about Paris. He irritates me in many ways. And in fact, uh, the first time I went down to uh, Devon in 1956 and met Malcolm Elwin, I remember Malcolm talking to me about Paris's work. And uh, I remember being very snappy and dismissive about Paris, saying that I just thought he was no good. And I must say, I'm not ashamed that I thought this, because on the evidence of the bits that I'd read, I'd read a few pages of Glastonbury Romance only, but I'd read one or two of the critical works. I'd tried to read uh, A Philosophy of Solitude, and uh, I had read The Pleasures of Literature all, all the way through. And I found his mind sloppy, soft. So, on the whole, I found him sort of pretty unreadable. Uh, Malcolm Elwin suggested that I should really try to read him, and actually it was Professor Wilson Knight who, in about 1958, said that I should really try a Glastonbury romance. I remember I read it driving back from London, uh, with my wife driving, and I decided, as I found driving so tremendously exhausting, particularly with my wife driving, I uh, decided that the best thing to do would be to concentrate upon a book and ignore the fact that I might uh, be hurled out of the world at any moment. And I did this. I read solidly for something like four hours. And I found that this exercise of sheer concentration and deliberately slowing down my mind not waiting for anything to happen or expecting anything to happen, but simply allowing myself to be caught by the book. Uh, I found that this suddenly swept me into the book, and it didn't take more than about 20 pages before I suddenly realized that <clears throat> here was something that I had not anticipated. What fascinated me about Powys then was the uh, sexual obsession, which, you know, if any of you have read my books, you'll also find. This was what interested me about Powers. And then, you may disagree with this totally. I don't mind if you disagree with this at all. And do shout out if you feel inclined to. I'm all for it. But, uh, what I found so fascinating about Powys was the notion that came into my head that this was a second-rate mind turned into a first-rate mind by a neurosis. And I must say, on the whole, I hold by this. I still feel this strongly about him. Uh, he irritates me like mad. You know, to begin with, I loathe the names of his characters. I sort of loathe names like, like Tossy and Tisty and Tosty and things like this. I feel, I feel that he's, um, he's, he's doing this deliberately to, to show that he is an independent mind. But unfortunately, you know, he's not going far enough. But the 
sexual obsession, I think, drives him so fiercely that whether he likes it or not, he has a sort of uh, pile-driving force in the best work that is due almost entirely to a kind of reaction. And I'll try, I'll try to explain that in a moment. However, before I go into Powys, I want to talk more fully about my own central obsessions and then try to interpret Powys in the light of these. Uh, because in a way I can't really explain what I mean fully unless I do explain fully my own central idea. My first book, The Outsider, was centrally concerned with this statement of Kierkegaard that truth is subjectivity. And it seemed to me that, that I understood this fully and completely. It seemed to me perfectly obvious that our central problem is the problem of feeling bored and alienated by this dreary life that we're forced to live through. It seemed to me perfectly obvious that the trouble is the sheer boredom of everyday physical existence, the fact that none of us are ever really, really deeply and completely satisfied, that life is a sort of thin, gritty soup that we're forced to eat because there's no more healthy food around. But then nevertheless, basically, we don't really enjoy it. I agree completely with Axel in the play of Villiers de Lille Adam when he said, um, live, our servants can do that for us. I was also fascinated by the beginning of that novel called The Near and the Far by L. H. Myers. And do you remember that at the beginning of that neglected novel, the young Prince Jarley and his um, parents have spent weeks crossing the desert to a sort of enormous conference called by um, the great um, Akbar, and that he stands on the battlements of the castle and looks out over the desert and suddenly reflects that there are two deserts, one of which is a glory to the eye and the other one of which is a weariness to the feet. That looking at this tremendous sunset, he feels an enormous excitement and yet at the same time, the feeling that nothing he can do can ever achieve that excitement of the horizon. That if he rushes downstairs and out into the desert, he would just get his sands full of sh uh, sand in his shoes. Well, this feeling that the horizon is unattainable, that the near is always boring, is something that has always obsessed me. Yeats has also expressed it in that poem called Towards Break of Day, in which he talks about uh, a waterfall upon Ben Bulban. He said, which all my childhood counted dear. Then he goes on to say, um, I would have touched it like a child, but knew my fingers would have touched cold stone and water. I grew wild, even accusing heaven, because it has set down among its laws nothing that we love overmuch is ponderable to the touch. The feeling of the unattainableness of the things that really interest us. This is the essence of Kierkegaard's statement, truth is subjectivity. Because normally, as I say, we are bored, and the only moments when you are not bored are the moments when you suddenly withdraw deep into yourself, when you become deeply interested in something, so completely interested that you care for nothing whatever except what focuses your attention completely. Uh, this total absorption in an object is not an enormous effort of the mind. It doesn't require any long discipline. It seems to happen completely spontaneously. Uh, in one of my books, Poetry and Mysticism, I express this idea when I say, uh, imagine that Dr. Watson has been sitting all the morning in Baker Street getting 
more and more bored with the fog outside and the fact that he's read the Times from cover to cover. And then he says casually to Holmes, almost sort of yawning, I see Lord Mancroft is dead, Holmes. Did you ever meet him? And Holmes says, as a matter of fact, Watson, that was one of the most bizarre cases of my whole career. Would you like to hear about it? And instantly, Watson's boredom vanishes. Now, what does Watson do to make his boredom vanish? Think about this. If I now talk for too long, you will begin to get bored. Your minds will begin to disperse. You will cease to concentrate upon me and allow your minds to wander all around the place. Where will your minds go when that happens? What will happen to them? They'll cease to focus. And anything that interests you instantaneously pulls the whole mind together. Now, this is one of the basically fascinating facts about human beings. Give us the slightest point of interest and instantaneously we are focusing our full powers on it. We obviously possess these powers all the time, but we don't know how to focus them. In other words, if you said to Watson two minutes before Holmes said this, by a single effort of your own mind, you can suddenly become totally concentrated. Totally fascinated, he would have said, how? And he would not have known how. Well, this notion of concentrating totally upon a thing requires, in a way, that you concentrate from the centre of your being. You, you become so absorbed in what interests you that you almost become the object. You cease to think about yourself. You notice one thing, when you're either bored or fed up or embarrassed or miserable, you are aware of yourself as a person. I become aware of me, Colin Wilson, and of things outside me in relation to me. And I can sort of see me as a kind of opaque object between the real perceptive self and the external world. I become aware of me as something out there in a way. This is boredom. When I become totally absorbed in something, the me disappears. I cease to be aware of Colin Wilson. I'm just a perceptive eye looking out at the external world. Now, this brings me to my second central point. Heidegger says somewhere in uh, Being and Time that the crisis of the modern world is due to what he calls forgetfulness of existence. We forget the real existence of the external world and become too absorbed in subjectivity. In other words, what Heidegger is saying is truth is objectivity. That which exists solidly out there. That we ourselves and our stupid subjective little states of emotion don't matter a damn. All that matters is that real world out there. In a world word, you might, might say the mathematical world, the world of eternal objects that subsists around us. Now, this is obviously a fundamental contradiction. Kierkegaard is obviously right. Truth is obviously subjectivity. And Heidegger is obviously right. Truth is obviously objectivity. <coughs> How do we reconcile these two? Now, it seems to me that in a way this is the key to Powers' work, that one can't get beyond and above the work until you see the answer to this particular question. The truth is that we are all, to a large extent, alienated. That is, the, that's the position in which you see yourself standing outside your, when you're bored, for example, you kind of drift, you go to pieces, you Im immediately become aware as you stare in a bored manner at something on the horizon that um, you are staring at it. In other words, you are outside yourself. You're aware of yourself an external object. Um, Sartre says the same kind of thing when he says that uh, if you are caught looking through a keyhole, you immediately feel yourself like a butterfly pinned on the end of the gaze of the person who's caught you. You become suddenly externalized, looking at yourself through his eyes. You cease to be entirely you in the center of your own being. Looking out from the center of your own being, you become a kind of external object. Now, this, I think, is the fundamental truth about human beings, that we are all the time becoming external objects to ourselves. You know, you, I mean, for example, talking to you now is an extremely difficult thing, in a sense, because 
I, I'm clearly aware of what I'm saying to you, and I'm also aware that I'm saying it, and I'm aware to some extent that of the effect I may be creating. And as soon as I step outside myself, now this doesn't bother me as far as lecturing goes, but earlier this year I started to do some television for our local station. And I discovered to my astonishment, having done television for years, that being forced to stand in front of a camera and talk straight into the camera as a sort of interviewer or introducer of the programme, that I froze and became horribly embarrassed. Suddenly, the fact that the floor manager was saying, OK, 90 seconds to go, 75 seconds, 60 seconds, and so on, and then, OK, now, go. And suddenly you are outside yourself. You become that object outside your normal natural self. No longer talking, as it were, from within your internal being. In other words, in a funny way, you become decentralized. When you are deeply absorbed in something, and as soon as Holmes says to Watson, the most bizarre case of my career, would you like to hear about it? Watson instantly becomes centralized. His whole being is absorbed totally in listening to what Holmes has to say. Uh, and this brings up another fascinating point. When you are bored, it exhausts you. When you are fascinated by something, your energy doesn't seem to disappear at all. In fact, it seems to increase. Doing a task that you really enjoy, you feel much more full of energy at the end of it than you did to begin with. In fact, the sure way of, as it were, uh, renewing your spiritual being, renewing your nervous energies, is to get really absorbed in something you enjoy. Now, what does this mean? It means that when you are bored, somehow you are using huge quantities of energy and yet wasting it. You are leaking. Consciousness is a kind of leaky bucket. And your energy is pouring out of holes in the side of it all the time. As soon as you are fascinated by something, you quite automatically stop up the leaks. As if you had little valves that closed. As if you, were, you wanted to hear an item of news on television, and there were children screaming outside the doors and windows, and you closed the doors fast and closed the windows, and then concentrated wholly on what you had to listen to. It's this business of total concentration upon one single thing. Our consciousness leaks, leaks continually. This is what destroys us. The consciousness of animals doesn't leak like this. And uh, Xiong Su says... The consciousness of a baby doesn't leak like this. It can keep its hands clenched for 24 hours together. Yet, you try it and it doesn't work. Why, for example, if I begin to talk about itching, do you begin to feel a, a need to scratch yourself cautiously? It's nothing to do with the uh, fact that you are really itching. Or supposing I begin to talk about coughing, why do you begin to feel an obsessive need to clear your throat? This is absurd. What is doing it? Who is doing it? Who is making you want to clear your throat or itch? <laughs> it's another you, so to speak, uh, entering into a certain kind of uh, conflict with the essential you and pushing into opposite directions. You remember that marvellous story of Viktor Frankl, who... Uh, derived his psychology from an anecdote he was told that at a certain school they needed to, uh, they had a play and they needed to find a boy to play the part of a stutterer, so they chose a boy who stuttered badly. When he got on stage he couldn't stutter for the life of him. He couldn't stutter thereafter. Frankl based his whole psychology upon this notion of the stutterer. In another case, uh, Frankel had a clerk, but this was before the war when bank clerks had to write handwriting, whose handwriting was deteriorating steadily. He was, he was Jewish and he had various other problems and he was afraid of being thrown out of the bank and his handwriting was getting worse and worse as he worried more and more about his job. So Frankel said, look, go home, take a sheet of paper, um, say to yourself, I'm going to be the worst handwriter in the whole world and try to make your handwriting as bad as you possibly can. Uh, after a couple of hours of trying to write badly, the Clark found that his handwriting um, improved. This is what Frankel called the law of reverse effort. 
we have in ourselves these curious forces pushing in opposite directions. There is what you might call the real you, the true you, and a completely false you that has nothing whatever to do with the real you. A hypnotist, for example, takes advantage of this. He deliberately uses what Frankl was talking about. Um, by swinging some object in front of your eyes in, in, so that your sight begins to tire, uh, he then begins to suggest things, as it were, to this secondary you. And you find yourself doing these things automatically in the way that a dog obeys its master's voice. Actually, I didn't mean to bring this into this lecture because I want to get on to Paris, and I promise I will before midnight. But this is a concept of mine called the robot. We all contain within us a kind of robot which does all kinds of things for us. You learn to type painfully and consciously, and then the robot takes it over and does it far more efficiently than you can do it tapping up with one finger. You learn to ride a bicycle, and suddenly the robot takes over and rides the bicycle for you. You learn to drive a car, you learn to speak French, and so on. At a certain point, you cease to have to do this slowly and painfully and consciously. The robot takes over instead and does it for you. Uh, this is the reason that we can be such highly efficient creatures. As a matter of fact, you know, my robot is now talking 99% to you at the moment. There's just the sort of real me slightly behind him, keeping him in line. And this is the interesting thing. Our robots do so much for us, and yet, the robot takes over far more than we want him to. You listen to a symphony or read a poem that moves you deeply, you listen to it to the, for the tenth time, and it's the robot listening instead. You're not experiencing it to the same extent. If the robot didn't exist, you'd enjoy every spring morning as intensely as you did when you were a baby. You'd listen to every symphony as intensely as you heard it the first time, but the robot takes over and listens for you. Now, clearly, our main problem is always to keep the robot out when we don't want him in. To allow him in only when we really need him to talk French or to type. But not when we're approaching a spring morning or a symphony or, or making love, you know, dozens of other things which the robot can do for us. Do you remember in Madame Bovary? After Charles Bovary's extreme ecstasy at the idea of marrying Emma, nevertheless, when he marries her, um, Flaubert says, after a while, he began to accept sex as a kind of dessert after his dinner. This is the robot taking over. The robot destroys the quality of our experience continually. It's continually squashing us so that we don't feel things that we should really feel. Nearly all our human problems are due to the robot taking over where we don't want him to take over. And this is the fundamental problem we experience, the lack of the freshness of experience and so on. Now, this business of the robot is what I was speaking of a few moments ago as alienation. You see yourself as it were standing outside yourself. What you're really seeing is the robot, a kind of shadow image of yourself, a few yards away from yourself, intercepting every experience and stopping it from getting through to the essential you. Now, how do we circumvent this robot? Any crisis will make you do it instantaneously. Do you remember in G.K. Chesterton, there's a man who points a gun at the head of pessimists who say they want to die, and they instantly discover they don't really want to die at all. Uh, Raskolnikov says, that if he had to stand on a narrow ledge for ever and ever, in eternal darkness, and eternal tempest, he would still rather than do this than die at once. Well, the question this raises is, what would you do if you were now told that you've got to stand on a narrow ledge for ever and ever, or even for a year? You'd commit suicide, or you'd certainly anticipate that you commit suicide. Do you see how near we all are to a certain edge at which we feel it's no longer worth living? Push us beyond a certain point, and we no longer want to go any further. Um, Rudy Nassau, who I think is an enormously underrated novelist, published a book called The Hooligan in 1960, brought up this thing about the Jews in the concentration camps. Why did they let themselves be massacred in this way? Clearly, because at a certain point, you no longer feel that it's worth going on. 
there is a point at which you say it is not worth it. And at that point you stop and backpedal. In other words, there is a barrier of defeat in your own mind. And you won't go beyond that barrier. You backpedal. Now, the problem is to somehow push beyond this barrier. And it seems to me that all men of genius do this quite instinctively. They have this feeling that somehow the barrier is a false barrier, like the magic fire in Wagner. But in fact, Siegfried can stride through if he recognises that it is magic fire and that it won't burn. The problem is in a way a problem of retreating to your own centre, your own true centre away from the robot, so that you are feeling and seeing and experiencing things and not the robot. This is the central problem. But how do we do this? Well, all men of any real power try to do it quite instinctively. And this is what Taoist did. In a way, uh, his answers were the sort of classic answers, although he achieved them completely instinctively. Uh, one way, for example, in which you can overcome this feeling of general alienation, your feeling of uh, <coughs> separation from the real world, is to retreat to something that's thoroughly familiar to you. For example, you know, the way that schoolboys, on their first day in a new school, feel completely alienated from the things that are surrounding them and are fed up with the whole thing. Feel themselves to be, as it were, high and dry and unable to stand any more of this and return home with an enormous feeling of relief to the bosom of the family. Or the way in which, for example, you know, if on a weekend like this you discover that you felt you were being uh, uh, boycotted, treated as an alien, and then you suddenly saw in the distance two close friends, you would immediately sort of fly to them and experience that relief of being able to talk closely to people who would allow you to be yourself, instead of standing outside yourself, seeing yourself as an alien, as a stranger, being alienated from yourself. What we actually do, of course, is to seek out symbols uh, a piece of music can suddenly bring this weird trickle of happiness, which actually, you know, um, you've seen, for example, those things where you look through two eyepieces trying to focus a picture. I forget what you call these things, you buy them in boots. And you can actually see two pictures all blurred like that. And then quite suddenly they click together and you get one single three-dimensional coloured picture. And they click together in a split second. And in the same way, you can look at certain visual um, illusions. You can look, for example, at a box drawn with the lines in one way, and you can see it as if it were from underneath. And then, a moment later, you can suddenly see it as if it were from above. You know the kind of things I mean. These visual illusions suddenly click into place, and are there quite abruptly. Well, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You, your real self and what you might call your shadow self, your robot, are like that, as a kind of peculiar blur. This happens particularly if you're embarrassed, if you're talking to somebody you're not quite sure about, or somebody you've just met. And then suddenly, if you're with a friend, the two just click together, and you save an enormous amount of energy. If I tried to lift up that chair like this, sitting here, I couldn't really do it, because, you know, my muscles aren't really made to operate that way. What I would have to do is to get over the chair and lift it like that. And in the same way, your mental muscles aren't made to operate this way, being embarrassed and awkward and being two selves, like that. You're made to be like that, one single self. And then you can operate from your true centre. Now, we operate far more efficiently when we do it from our true centre. And all mystics know this instinctively. Now, this is the interesting thing about powers. It seems to me that Powis began as a very second-rate writer, a very second-rate mind. 
as I say, sort of literally on Tabitha. And that slowly his sexual obsession forced him, whether he liked it or not, to make an enormous effort which gradually unified his being. This is a this is a central point. I remember Negley Farson, who was an old friend who lived down in North Devon, telling me that he had an alcoholic problem. He went along to see a psychiatrist, who, after a long course of psychoanalysis, said to him, uh, "I wouldn't get cured if I were you. Um, your genius depends on your being uncured." Andre Gide, I think, uh, once said something of the sort too. This notion that it is, in fact, the conflict between the two halves that somehow makes you make a far greater effort. Now, this brings me to my central point. And this is the central point, I think, of all my work. It's my lifelong obsession. That is this horrible inefficiency of consciousness. The fact that consciousness is losing vast quantities of energy continuously. That we're working at something like a sixteenth of our real power. And we know this in certain moments when we're deeply absorbed. When Holmes says, would you like to hear about it, Watson? You suddenly concentrate fiercely and totally upon what interests you. We're always doing this and discovering this truth about ourselves, that we contain enormous depths of power and energy that we do not normally call upon. Uh, Powis says this somewhere, I think, in Wolf Solent. Um, Dick Wilson Knight quotes it in uh, his Saturnian Quest. The, uh, something to the effect that the miserablest soul has enormous godlike thunderbolts concealed inside it. The further you are from your true self, the weaker you are, the less you are able to exert any force directly upon the real world. The closer you come to your real self, the more direct force you are able to exert. Now, the interesting thing is that we seldom come anywhere near to our real self. When we do, we experience an enormous orgasmic sort of experience that suddenly gives us glimpses and vistas of power we contain that normally are completely beyond our grasp. That we are all supermen without recognising it. That we contain enormous, giant, atomic forces that we can release if only we had the belief to release them. Again and again and again we recognize this. Every time we experience a moment of exaltation, a moment of intensity, we recognize this. Because what do we always recognize in the moments of intensity? When we, as it were, ask ourselves, what do I need to do in my normal, bored, everyday state to achieve this intensity? You recognize every time what you needed was a certain kind of courage and drive and optimism and refusal to be beaten. We are so easily bloody defeated. We're defeated continually. We're always being smashed back by the forces of everyday reality from the moment we get up in the morning. Everything defeats us and bores us. Everything gives us this feeling of, oh, it's not worthwhile. From the moment you open the curtains and see a grey day outside, we're always being pushed backwards. So we experience these occasional moments of intense reality, say, you know, twice a year, when we suddenly realize the forces we contain. And the rest of the time, we're wasting our time completely. We're crawling around with our noses on the ground, with no idea of the direction we could move in. Now, this is something, it's not mysticism, it, this is solid, ordinary, common sense. Everybody's experienced it. Everybody knows precisely what I mean. And we're crawling around in this stupid, blind way. Most of the time, we look for ways in which we overcome our alienation by thinking about childhood, by thinking about other things that are familiar to us. We listen to music that moves us deeply. We sort of look to symbols that mean something to us. They could be patriotic symbols or something. Or anything will suddenly sweep us together, sweep us out of our normal condition of being apart from our real selves. All poets do this completely instinctively. This is the reason that nearly all major writers begin by looking back on childhood, looking back on the past. The past is natural, so that you get, you know, Tolstoy beginning his career by writing about his childhood. Aksakov, Proust. This is, this is completely natural. You begin by discovering your true self, by, in the early period of adulthood, when you're feeling completely separated from your real self, you retreat back into your real self, that is to say, into a time 
when you can cease to be aware of this bloody shadow haunting you all the time. Step back into a time when suddenly you accept the world, you accept yourself, and above all, you feel no need to look at yourself in a mirror. This raises enormously complex problems, which I can't go into at the moment. The whole problem of the mirror, and the way that we do form a mirror image of ourselves in order to live at all, and that you act up to a mirror image of yourself in order to live at all. You project a mirror image and act according to the mirror image. And the bigger the mirror image, the real you are. I raised this question in The Outsider. The central question, why did Nietzsche and Van Gogh and Nijinsky go insane? It was because they were not sufficiently sure of themselves. They were not sufficiently confident of their own powers. They did not believe in the occasional moment when they experienced a sudden overwhelming explosion of certainty. They weren't willing to stick faithfully by that insight. They went back to the normal bored self. There have been cases of people who were totally mistaken about themselves. You remember Benjamin Robert Hayden, Keats's friend, who committed suicide in the time of Robert Browning, sort of about 1853. Uh, Hayden believed that he was a great painter, and he wasn't. He was a lousy painter. Uh, there are many examples of this, and they've gone out of my head because I went to this bloody cocktail party earlier. But there are dozens of examples of people who really uh, believe themselves to be major writers or painters and who weren't. But compared to this, the people like T. Lawrence and Van Gogh, who were major writers and who didn't believe it, and who therefore never did it, whose work is basically flawed, because like me on television, at that moment when they should have gone, they suddenly feel an awful withdrawal. The desire not to go forward, the sudden, the sudden doubt, the sudden desire to pull back. Do you know that story of Merpassant called, uh, it, it, it may seem to you frivolous to keep introducing these names when I'm supposed to be talking about powers, but I promise I will get around to them called The Unknown, in which a man says that he keeps passing a girl in the street who sexually excited him enormously. His thought was that if only he could get her into bed. Uh, he saw her for a whole year and didn't get a chance until one day he actually did manage to encounter her and she dropped a glove or something of the sort. He got into conversation and when he said, you know, could I see you again, to his amazement, the girl not only gave him her address, but said, you know, come at this time tomorrow. Well, this already began to worry him a little, because it was a little too easy. And when he got to her place the next day, uh, the, um, after 20 minutes conversation, she began to take off her clothes. Uh, at this point, he began to undress, and suddenly, looking at the girl, he saw that she had a fine line of dark hair down the centre of her back. And he said, quite suddenly, he said, he just went, Ugh. he said, my song of love went unsung. And he said with great embarrassment, I'm awfully sorry, but uh, I'm unable. And the girl said with contempt, in that case, why did you bring me here? And he crept off, and he says, whenever subsequently he sees her in the street, he always bows, but she passes him. This is what Stendhal called Le Fiasco. Total sexual failure. Why? What happened, precisely? How do you define this? Why, when he'd wanted the girl for a year, did he suddenly, seeing her taking off her clothes, cease to want her instantaneously? The line of dark hair was obviously somehow symbolic, never mind what it was a symbol of, but he was already worried. He was no longer driving forward. Suddenly, he was doubtful, it was a little too easy, he was worried. And then, some small thing, like the line of dark hair down her back, was enough to completely turn him off. You see what I mean? Our energies are continually driving forward when we're interested in something, and then when we begin to get tired, they begin to stop, and then they begin to go into reverse.
when they begin to go into reverse, things either begin to bore you or upset you or suddenly cause that, cause that awful falling out of the bottom of your stomach. We're all the time in this state between these two states of moving forward and backwards. Now, this is the central problem we have to contend with. Now, to, to get down to Powys for a moment, um, do you remember at the beginning of um, Maiden Castle, where um, Dud No Man talks about uh, the fact that he's uh, been married to an extremely beautiful girl for years, but has never made love to her, and that now, after her death, he spends his time masturbating? This is completely typical of Powys. Why? Why behave in this completely paradoxical way? This is not sort of, you know, deliberate Dostoevsky and parallel or something of sheer irrationality. The fact, do you remember at the beginning of, um, of Wuthering Heights, when the, the male who's writing the story says that in a watering place in Yorkshire, he met an extremely beautiful young girl with her mother. He became infatuated with her. Um, he decided that he badly wanted her. And then... Uh, as soon as she began to show any sign of interest in him, quite suddenly his interest evaporated. He withdrew. This paradoxical withdrawal, as soon as you start to get what you want, this you can see is closely related to Frankel's law of reverse effort. It's the stutterer who can't stutter when he's told to stutter. Our real powers are completely tied up inside us, twisted up in a tight knot, and we don't know how to untie them. Why does Dud No Man, or rather, why did Powis have this fantasy about Dud No Man? Why did it seem so important to him? Clearly, because when you want something sufficiently, you overcome this absurdity of human consciousness, this stupidity, that our forces are normally enormously diminished. Uh, I, I, um, what, how long am I allowed to go on here? I'm supposed to stop in five minutes, and I stand, I'm nowhere near. Yeah. I, I found some letters of Paris that, as far as I know, haven't been published about ma masturbating. Uh, these are fascinating because uh, they, they illustrate this point I'm making. He was writing to some chap called Luis Ribeiro. I never heard of him. I know nothing about him. I came upon these completely by chance, and somebody has given me the photostats of them. He says in one of them, um, I'm now reading aloud to my Miss Phyllis the Pelican book with the paperbacks edited by a called Colette Clark and entitled Hermit Grasmere, all about the love between William Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth, his sister. This book suits me perfectly, for in our big family of six boys and five girls, we were all of us constantly making love to each other. The idea that such incest was wrong, though we were the children of a clergyman, never entered our heads. That's the wrong one, actually, but to my point. Uh, yes, my life from my earliest childhood till the erotic urge left me at 80, um, I was sexually excited by nothing but cruelty. Masturbation, masturbation, masturbation was my whole sexual life, though I did beget one son who died a Catholic priest at 51. Oh, my dear friend, do tell me one thing. What do you mean when you talk about the CP? Do you mean the masculine organ of generation? At school we used to call that our prick or our cock and the feminine opposite of it, into which it was to be thrust, we used to call a lady's quim. Yes, a prick or a cock into a quim were the words, with lots of exclamation marks all the way along. This sort of, and this letter is dated 1958, sort of fairly late on, you know, as you can see after 80. Uh, I've been all my life an incurable masturbator, but I've always been too timid to make actual love to actual girls, which must be untrue if he had a son. Only once in my long life did I make friends with a real London prostitute. Her name was Lily, and in her character she was very like De Quincey's London prostitute, who saved his life by spending her earnings on buying him wine, when without it he would have died. In the end he lost her just as I lost my Lily. She was an absolute darling, but all her desires had nothing whatever to do with sex. She was a nervous, timid, slender little girl, but she ruled me completely as nice women will rule me till I died. Till I die. I implored her to tell me what she wanted, and I can so well record two things she made me do. 
She made me take her to the grave of Dan Lino, the famous clown, and she made me take her, respectively, sleeping in a different room with her little nieces to Brighton for a holiday. This sort of strange innocence of Powys. You see, the relating back to Dub Nomad. That uh, early chapter of a Glastonbury romance, where John Crow and uh, Mary sort of masturbate one another in a field. I, I must, I must, must you, you, may, you may feel that I've sort of jumped from what I was saying previously about the centre of consciousness, but in fact, I've written a book called Origin of the Sexual Impulse, in which I've gone into this whole question closely. And what I've said in essence is, all sexual perversion is in point of fact, this separation of you from your real self. What happened to someone like Dessard? How could he get more and more absorbed in... I'm sure there is, and I'm full of it. Don't you think it might be better to ask questions like that at the moment Mr. Wilson's finished? Well, I, I don't mind like at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do. Yeah. I'm delighted to sort of interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, do by all means. Mm. <coughs> Mm. No, and you misunderstand me slightly. Uh, that is to say, but I don't think that uh, he wasn't a genius born in a way. I don't think that anyone is a genius born. See, what I was saying earlier about Negley Fasten and so on, consciousness is so inefficient that we fail to do what we could do because we don't see what we've got to do. We are bored. We are stuck in the present. We don't know where to go or what to do. There's no way forward we can see to exercise our powers. We are apart from our real selves. Now the question is to somehow become, to stand upon your own centre and to drive forward. Now it seems to me... Why do you make this jump that you and you rightly say that we all feel that the whole of our life is one of continuous boredom? I'm going to suggest that this jump possible, and I, I, but I, I, I want very much to understand how this relates to Percy's uh, sexual urge, which I think it may well do. How are you relating to this? Well, this, this is in fact a central uh, question. I, I'll, try, I'll try to outline this as, as quickly as I can, because it is a question we've touched on once or twice this weekend. Uh, you remember George Steiner last night quoted this business about the difference between the sexual urge in the man and the woman. Now, this has always uh, absorbed me. In A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay, which I think is one of the greatest novels of the 20th century, he has a curious episode that seems to me to express with great precision what I mean by masculine sexuality. Uh, he has an episode in which a man on another planet, meets another man, asks him to do something and the other man refuses. He then seizes him in his arms, strains him against him and literally sucks the life out of him like a vampire. And then Lindsay goes on to say, this is, the, this is actually the first time he's ever done this, 
he's suddenly generated a new organ by which he can absorb people. You know, incidentally, last night, something of the same sort about absorption of the woman by the man. <coughs> Lindsay goes on to say, suddenly he comprehended the completely sweet nature of absorbing. It satisfied the will as food satisfies the stomach. Uh, <clears throat> and in the, when I was in America, I read this to my students, who were sort of half women, and said, to me, this is the essence of the male sexual urge, this sort of brutal desire to suck the life, in a way, out of a woman. I found a passage in uh, the Poet's autobiography which says precisely the same, uh, the same thing, if I can find it. He, uh, he says that... Uh, few women have an idea, the remotest idea, of the insane impersonality of masculine lust when it runs amok at these deadly and sterile tangents talking about his own ab absorption with young girls on beaches and so on. This, I said to my students, seems to me to be the essence of the male sexual urge. What do you think is the essence of the female sexual urge? All of them sort of waffled around this question in the paper I sent them. Only one of them had the courage to say, I don't know whether she was right or not, but maybe the women in the audience can answer me, that if the male sexual urge is a desire to absorb, then the female sexual urge is a desire to be absorbed. Well, I don't know, I you know women's lib would disagree violently. But it seems to me that this is the essence of the male sexual urge. Now, what happens when this sexual urge is badly frustrated, as it was in Powers? So, as the son of a Victorian clergyman, he didn't have much opportunity for sex. Now, it is my belief, and I've said this frequently before, but I've, and this only applies mine to a small percentage of men and women, that the sexual satisfaction, promiscuous sexual satisfaction, is of enormous importance. I even said jokingly once that I felt that men and women uh, should be forced to provide a certificate before they marry, proving they've slept with 30 members of the opposite sex. Now, I do feel that, uh, and this incidentally is true only of 5% of the human race. You know about this, don't you? Uh, the dominant 5%, I see my readers nodding. <laughs> the, um, Bob Ardrey pointed it out to me ten years ago. They discovered in Korea, when they, um, there was a question of the Chinese keeping American soldiers under heavy guard, they, de they decided that it would be easier to separate the really dangerous prisoners out from the rest of the prisoners and keep them under separate guard. They discovered when they did this that they could keep the dangerous prisoners under heavy guard and they could leave the, leave the other prisoners with no guard at all. They just didn't need a guard when you'd taken away the dangerous ones from them. Now, the odd thing was that the Chinese discovered again and again that the dangerous prisoners were precisely 5% of the total number of American prisoners. And this applies generally. Not, not only applies to human beings, the Communist Party, for example, is precisely 5% of the total population of the Soviet Union. Uh, but it applies, for example, among rats. The um, John Calhoun at um, Bethesda at the National Institute of Mental Health did an experiment in which rats were kept in various cages, overcrowded deliberately. The dominant 5% among the rats became a criminal 5%. It was exactly 5%. This 5% turns up again and again. Among human beings, there are exactly 5% who are dominant and who must express this dominance in, in terms of other people. Uh, they may, I'm not saying they're geniuses. They're 5% of sort of pop singers, sergeants in the army, um, foremen in factories, all kinds of things. It's only sort of maybe 0.5% of the 5% who are talented in the sense that you know we normally mean, and probably 0.05% who are so talented that they can express their talent totally without the need to impose it upon other people. 
Lock Schubert in a room alone, and he emerges with a song. Lock Einstein in a room alone, and he emerges with a mathematical theorem. It is this fact that people... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not subject myself particularly to boredom, but, uh, but uh, in fact, in fact, you have put your finger upon another central point, that in a sense all my life I have been obsessed by boredom. When I was 15... Well, many people would disagree. I was saying, when I was 15, I came across a statement in a book by a clergyman, something about the curious mystery of human boredom. This has always struck me as being fundamentally true of us. That boredom is, in fact, a mystery. That we are living in an eternally fascinating universe, and yet we find it totally impossible to break through this curious shell to the reality of the external universe. Now, let me get back to what I was saying a moment ago about powers and sexuality. Sexuality is one of the simplest methods of breaking out of our normal shell of semi-boredom, of not living fully and completely, because it concentrates your mind totally upon an object for a brief period of time. As soon as you concentrate, you close your valves, the leakages cease, and suddenly you discover your inner pressure rising. Now, the essence of mysticism is this. If we are capable of, at certain moments, raising our inner pressure to this extent that we are no longer bored in any way, how far are we capable of going beyond this to what Powell said, to in fact containing explosive forces that we could use? All of us struggle to do this instinctively, but the geniuses like Powell go further than the rest of us. And what I'm saying is this, in essence, Powell took until his fifties before he learned how to do it. I didn't agree with someone last night who said that we should republish Duck Dam and Wood and Stone. I think they're bloody boring novels. Um, oh, of course it's my opinion. Who else is, would it be? Everything I'm saying is my opinion, and if it irritates, it would. I'm saying that it took him until his mid-fifties. Why did it take him until his mid-fifties? Because, what I said earlier, about the central point of the outsider, that such people lack the curious certainty to say to themselves, at an early point, I possess genius. Genius is the power to escape completely from my subjective, miserable states in which I am absorbed in women on a beach, in a girl I met at the door of a cottage who so obsesses me that I can't stop thinking about her days. Genius is the power to break beyond these things that hold me in to the purely objective universe outside until I'm totally fascinated by things that are going on around me, by wood and stone and, and pure objects, and to forget myself totally and completely. This is what all genius means. I even came before I, I, I came here this evening across a passage in Einstein in which he says, out yonder there was this huge world which exists independently of us human beings and which stands before us like a vast eternal riddle, at least partially accessible to observation and analysis. To study such a world sets free one's mind. I soon noticed that many a man whom I'd learned to respect and had found inner freedom and security in this discipline. In other words, what I was saying at the beginning, we must, we begin with the Truth is subjectivity notion. We all must move back into our real self, but when you move back into your real self, this is the point where you begin to move outwards into the purely external universe, where out of sheer joy in escaping your stupid, everyday personality that you've been dragging around with you for your whole life, this is the point where you become totally fascinated.
by the external world and out of sheer strength begin to throw the external world around like a weightlifter throwing weights. This is what Powis did in a Glastonbury romance. This explains what Angus was saying this morning about the fact that Powis's Glastonbury romance appears to get nowhere and yet it's full of the most amazing characters. He was, or I may be misquoting you, but he's throwing characters around like great weighted stones and yet the book gets nowhere. The, the, he realises that he ought to have a kind of climax, so he creates an absolutely stupid climax. But it's totally unconvincing. And yet, he creates so many characters. Why are we, all of us, fascinated by Powys? Simply because, when we read Powys, it's totally unlike reading, say, Kafka or Beckett, who are all twisted up in their own stupid, subjective little miseries. You enter Paris's world, you enter these characters and people, and suddenly you're outside yourself. You're looking at real solid people created like stones. He shows his creative power by passing beyond subjectivity. It took him something like 55 years to do it. This, for me, is the tragedy of Paris, that it took him 55 years to do it, and that within five years he was creating stuff like Maiden Castle, and then, for me, you know, the completely useless things of his later years, because I can't read any of these things, and it strikes me as things like, you know, All or Nothing and so on, in spite of my friend Dick Wilson Knight here, they're completely unreadable. I wouldn't apply this to Shaw, no, this is true, but I, mean, I admire Shaw much more. I mean, are you in his attitude to sexuality, no. I think it's a more subtle problem. I think the problem is to do to do with pushing a certain attitude further and further. I think he had uh, this mystical notion that you begin by creating things outside yourselves as realities. Yeats has these superb three lines. Shakespearean fish swam the sea far away from land. Romantic fish swim in nets coming close to hand. But what are all those fish that lie gasping on the strand? In other words, when you're terribly subjective like Beckett, you're so absorbed in your own stupid little states that you just create fish gasping on the strand. The creativity just doesn't get outside yourself, it's just here. The romantic at least gets a bit further away. He talks about himself obsessively, but is a bit more universal. Romantic fish swim in nets, but coming close to hand. But what are the, the Shakespearean fish are the ones that are important. The fish swimming out to sea, although I should add that I loathe Shakespeare. He seems to me vastly overrated. And I, think, I thought I should add that in case you think that I'm praising Shakespeare in the same breath as Paris. Uh, what I'm saying is that, that when we create that power to be objective, you go beyond truth is subjectivity, and most human beings never even get to that stage. They never identify their true self with the shadow self, with a robot. When you have finally identified these two together, then, suddenly, you become, begin, begin to be absorbed in the external world, in things around you. The more fascinated you become, like, say, an Einstein or something of the sort, the more totally absorbed you become in the external world, and eventually you would reach a real momentum that could carry you through into tremendous genius. And genius is objectivity, pure objectivity. That's what Powers was doing after the age of 55, with Wolf Solis and a glass of Brie Romance and, and Job of Scold. These were all exercises in pure objectivity for the sheer strength of it. And unfortunately, by that time, I mean, Powers never had much mind anyway in the sense of an intellect. He couldn't work out what he was doing. He couldn't see it clearly enough. Now, this means that the symbols he set up as his reality, as his thing that suddenly drew him back to his true centre, became the things that obsessed him. So that, you know, and by the symbols, I mean this business about stones talking and trees talking and all the rest of it. And so as the work goes on, you suddenly get the emporious, it seems to me, the real, the real decline begins you suddenly get this obsessive interest in trees and stones, but he then goes to the silly stage and starts to make them talk. And this goes on, I think, until the late work, and it seems to me that from, from then on, the real power, although the genius is still present, has broken its centre of gravity. It's broken its backbone. It's forced to drive forward. He lacked the force earlier on to believe that he really had something to say. You only have to read these things of Lewis Wilkinson and so on to see that this is true. The usual interpretation of past life is that he began as a lecturer, and that this was as a lecturer that he found his early, perhaps 25 years, his most total expression. Mm. 
do you think that's possibly true? Uh, yes, I know it is in, indeed true. So, 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 don't, don't you think he was already focusing this to himself? No, um, to some extent. In fact, he has this superb expression in the autobiography, talking about lecturing in San Francisco about Strindberg to a small audience of four old ladies or something, when he said suddenly he became so completely absorbed in his subject Strindberg, who was a bloody idiot, as you know. I mean, to become, to identify with Strindberg to this extent is no sort of great feat of the intellect or imagination, but the total identification, he said, suddenly gave him again that overwhelming feeling of sheer power. When, and when he suddenly, he said, he saw the basic truth of the universe, that the greatness of man is to become identified with the madness of God. This, I think, is the thing that comes out in all our moments of total absorption. Why was he like that? Because he'd become totally absorbed in Strindberg. He had become Strindberg, the shadow had merged into the real self, and quite suddenly, the real force was able to emerge. We all of us experience this force briefly at all kinds of times in the sexual orgasm, most notably. We suddenly know that we are atomic bombs and that we are stupidly damped. That everything about us is damping down our real forces. It seems to me that Pauls' importance is simply in understanding this to a minor extent. And I think that what Paris is looking for is a relationship between these two things. And he says somewhere, I forget where, that the greatest power in the universe is um, unfulfilled desire. And I think that um, in the beginning, he tries to fulfill this desire through subjectivity, his perhaps sexuality. And later on, he tries to fulfill it in a more objective way through um, identification. And I think this is where the change occurs where his um, <coughs> desire is less limited, but would you agree with that? Hmm. Again, mm. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, uh, well, that's today's question. Would you agree with that? Yes, very much indeed. Yes. Mm. yes. Very, very much. And again, you see, in this whole business I said earlier, that in Maiden Castle, this is the book in which Paris talks about the business of unfulfilled desire. Why should unfulfilled desire be more interesting than fulfilled desire? Remember those lines in Eliot about the torment of love unsatisfied and the greater torment of love satisfied? Why? This is an absurdity. Why, if you want something badly, should it be a greater torment when you actually satisfy it? Because as soon as we satisfy desire, our whole inner being flops and collapses. It's this defeat, le fiasco, Maupassant's hero with his penis drooping. This is the essence of our inner being, this flop, this, this detumescence. We're continually doing it. So to talk about the need for eternal lack of satisfaction for never achieving orgasm is merely to recognize very clearly this basic fault about human beings that we are continually floppy inside and we must have something to sort of keep our peckers up, so to speak.
<laughs> I think you're being misled by the nature of my metaphors. I'd, I'd find it far more difficult to find animistic metaphors for what I'm trying to say. But what have you just said, in fact, except that I was saying what I was saying earlier, that the imagination must keep reaching out to the objective. Oh, yes, indeed, all the time. Oh, this, this uh, doesn't terribly matter, I think. Uh, I think anybody with any belief in themselves has to sort of keep plodding on in a straight line, observing as far as possible where they may be going wrong. But our chief trouble, as I keep repeating over and over again, is that we don't have the power or the strength to keep going in a straight line. We are always being absorbed or turned off our path by other things around us. Now, what um, the gentleman at the back was saying a moment or two ago is central here, that we, the mechanistic metaphor doesn't matter. What matters is this business of being absorbed. Do you remember in uh, Wolf Solent, the mythologizing, and in Porius, the, what does he call it, cavoseniagizing, but in both these cases, what it amounted to was suddenly to become totally absorbed in some external object. To, as it were, suddenly give up your normal trapped little self. Now, think of the earlier thing about Frankel and his pupils. What happens when you are told to stutter, when you are a stutterer? You cease to be worried, oh God, am I going to stutter? and suddenly begin to be absorbed in the external business about stuttering. You externalize stuttering. You see it coldly from a distance. And suddenly, enormous relief, this horrible inner steam pressure evaporates. You are suddenly in contact with the external universe. You remember Blake at the beginning of Europe says, five windows like the cavern man, through one he breathes the air, through one he hears music of the spheres and so on. But he finishes by saying, through one can pass out what time he will. Now, what does he mean by that? You can't pass out through your eyes or your ears. You certainly can't stand in the world outside yourself in the ordinary sense. And yet in this sense, you can. You can pass out from your normal self into external things. It is this business of externalizing, suddenly getting beyond your trapped subjective little self. This is what Powers was all about. And it doesn't matter whether you use an animistic or a mechanistic metaphor for it. This is what creation is all about, basically. We ought to be learning from Powis precisely the way that he did this, because he was rather clever. He did it entirely instinctively from inside. He, n he never sort of thought it out in the way that I have, in sort of intellectual terms. <coughs> he did it entirely as a kind of force of nature, bursting bonds from inside. And it's extremely clear in his best work. He says it over and over again. He teaches you how to do it. He teaches you how to escape yourself. To admire Powers as a novelist seems to me to be a, an absurdity. He's infinitely more than that. His importance is what he was himself. The novels are excretion. They're something that he produced. They're byproducts. They're cast off byproducts. It doesn't matter whether Wolf Solent or a Glastonbury romance of good novels are, are not. There is cast off skin. What matters is Powers himself. So doesn't that contradict your own your interpretation of his biography that only only by writing these good novels did he in fact focus? Surely that I would think that that, that the evidence of your of the autobiography is that, is that it was essentially not an active process. This focusing it was something that that was if you like a fatality that happened to him uh, slowly through at the beginning of his life and gradually increasingly throughout his life. But that uh, although he he he, he uh, was very attentive to these moments. He didn't. I, I, do, do you think he, he, he developed um, he developed very consciously as a technique? No, no, don't forget, there's nothing contradictory in this. You, you write novels and all the rest of it by way of, as it were, you use them in order to express something. You force them out of your pores in the way that a volcano, when it explodes, forces a great mass of magma out of its tube. The magma is the novel, and it comes up with a terrific explosion and showers of sparks, and it makes a marvellous show. But, nevertheless, you know, the important thing is the volcano shouldn't have formed in the first place. It's these enormous, absurd inner pressures. So, to be very simple about this, my basic psychological view of human evolution is this. My last book about Abraham Maslow expressed this fairly clearly. Maslow said that neurosis is not due to kind of Freudian substrata of erotic energies. 
He said that we all possess certain levels. We all, for example, need a roof over our head, and so on. Um, once this is satisfied, we need food to begin with. If you're hungry, you can think about absolutely nothing else. Then a roof over your head. <coughs> then, once you've satisfied that need, let's say sexuality, um, the need for a wife or a husband, and children. Once you've satisfied that need, the need for self-esteem, for other people to respect you and like you. This is the reason so many people want to be writers or painters or artists. It's this desire to be universally acknowledged and recognized. But once you've satisfied even this desire, self-esteem, Maslow said, you want to a higher desire still, which the purely creative for its own sake, for fun as it were, the mystical desire to just expand yourself. Now in other words, man is like a kind of forward-flowing river. His energies naturally flow forward, not only into the future, but as it were, uphill. And that if you dam up this river, the river kind of backs up and forms an enormous lake. This is when you begin to create the really dangerous neuroses. You know, you throw a single stone in the lake, and there are great ripples going all the way across it. So, for example, like Powys, you suddenly discover that you don't want to touch doorknobs. You get somebody else to open the door for you before you go in. Dr. Johnson wouldn't stand on the steps in the paving stones. He tried to sort of stand in between them. All these weird obsessions you develop when the lake backs up, when the river backs up, when the forward flow can no longer go on. When the forward flow is going on, you're so totally absorbed in the forward flow that you don't care about anything else. You become completely colourless, completely impersonal. You're totally absorbed in the external universe in the way that a mother is absorbed in her child. It's only when you, this flow is dammed up that suddenly you become aware of yourself. Which, and eventually of your neuroses, and eventually it's sort of like wanting to piss badly. Your bladder suddenly becomes so painful that you're thinking of nothing in the world but getting to the nearest lavatory. This is neurosis, the damming up of your forward flow of creative energies. Now, it seems to me that Paris epitomizes this absolutely perfectly. Anyway, how, some of you probably Can want to piss badly. Shall we go? I have a question. How? You've had a question. The thing which you want to get to is to explain. It seems to me a very interesting point. Why this should come along... Uh, why is it damned up? Is it a damning up that finally expresses itself? Is it a, a release of artistic energy that is somehow developed during that time? Is it a release of sexual energy? Well, it seems to me that's, you know, that's kind of the key of what you want to say. I, I, want you to tell I thought I said it straight up, but I certainly said it more clearly. Not in relationship to the art, and I, I'm concerned with the, the mixing up of metaphors, not in you, but in most historians of course, literary critics, between the sexual metaphor and the art metaphor of creativity. Well, now, is it a sexual creativity that finally expresses itself, matures at, at, at 50? Or is it a denial of it? Is it a transformation of that particular energy which is replaced, sublimated perhaps, in a work of art? Right? Just, what happens that, you know, with, uh, in 1929 or so, about the 26th? Well, no, what, what I've said basically is that I feel, to begin with, power is, if at some early stage he'd said to himself, I'm a creator. I'm a major creator. This is my problem. I've got to deal with it. He would have started creating major work much earlier. As it was, I think he was a curiously modest man. And now, while modesty is very admirable and the sort of the, the thing that the English admire above all other things, nevertheless, it's not a particularly desirable trait in a creative person. Because the creative person must recognize that he must have this forward drive that is his, he's the custodian of it. Now, it seems to me Pius took so long to do this. Now, the other half of your question is this. Pius also said that although he contained enough inner pressures to blow him sky high, remember he says this in the autobiography, that he experienced tremendous cross-currents of neurosis, nevertheless he did not snap and was never even under the danger of a nervous breakdown. What he was doing quite instinctively was channeling these neuroses, these powers, he recognized that if he didn't have them, he would have been a bore, like Negley Farson without his neuroses. He needed the neuroses, and he used them cunningly and instinctively in the way that creative people do. Now, I think it took a hell of a while for it to build up until his mid-50s. I think by the mid-50s, he had the courage to express these sexual things in a way that I completely admire. This, this is what stuns me about Powys, that still, having read Hubert Selby Jr. and Henry Miller and all the rest of these people, Powys still seems to me to be saying far more brutally than any other 20th century author, with the single exception of Frank Vadekind, the things that I myself feel about sex, certainly not that bloody fool Lawrence. 
who strikes me as completely sort of sentimental and second rate. He seems to me to have this sort of vicious, total, clenched forward creative drive, which comes in a way from the recognition of what sexuality is. I'm not saying that his, sex, his sexuality made his creative drive. What I am saying is that when the creative drive fully recognizes its own nature, it becomes a kind of erect penis, if you like, totally, a dri to totally capable of driving through a board, that it takes so much self-belief to create this sort of intense central sexual drive. And what I am saying is that I believe this is the essence of Powis, that the obsessive emphasis upon sex do you remember the magician in, uh, in The Brazen Head that Dick Wilson Knight reminded me of this morning with a magnet touching his prick, who um, is able to exercise enormous power over other people? This is it, the recognition of this enormous power whose... No, it's not true that it centres the sexual drive. Because I've said this again and again, the sexual drive is something whose below which there are enormous depths which are non-sexual. Freud was completely wrong. Our deepest powers are not sexual. Our deepest powers are non-sexual. Our deepest powers are some sort of enormous deep drive of the will, of which the sexual drive itself is a servant. I think this is what Paris was trying to get at in the Glastonbury romance, with his talk, you know, about the dual nature of good and evil and the sun and all the rest of it. It's an instinctive recognition that sex is not really all that important. And yet it's the... No, not at all. I, de I delight in interruption. <laughs> However, I do feel that everybody probably wants to go home. Okay, well, uh, uh, I want to thank Mr. Wilson for his talk. Uh, I always imagined that, uh, that uh, to some audiences, Paris must have uh, danced something on Malice Dance and uh, have, have partly taunted the audience. And I think really Mr. Wilson has uh, certainly succeeded in, in doing that for uh, some uh, people. But I think also he has uh, given some clue as to why Paris did write so late. Um, um, and also, there's no doubt that at every point uh, at this conference, we have um, touched on this the problem that Mr. Steiner called giggliness. Um, um, which is certainly very close to what Mr. Wilson has um, groped towards. Right. Okay.